Hey, everybody. Welcome back to a, another episode of Cosmos from Your Couch. My name is Kara Manovich. I'm Events and Outreach Officer here at the Dunlap Institute at the University of Toronto. Um, tonight's episode is uh, a special one. Actually, it's our 20th episode, um, our 15th week of this, um, and we couldn't have done it without you guys. You keep coming back and, and wanting to learn more, and um, we love being here for you. So uh, tonight's talk um, is uh, one I'm really excited about. It's um, going to be done by uh, Charles Woodford. He is a uh, graduate student at the Department of Physics and the Canadian Institute for um, Theoretical Astrophysics, um, which we also call CETA. So without further ado, um, I'm going to give it give the reins over to um, CJ to get started and please enjoy. All right. Hey folks, uh, thank you for having me, Kara and Dunlap, um, for this installation of Cosmos for Me Couch. I'm really excited to talk to you guys tonight and uh, I didn't even realize it was the 20th installation. It feels like a great honor uh, to do this particular one. So I hope you enjoy as much as um, I enjoyed making this content for you. So as uh, Kara mentioned, my name is Charles Woodford. Most people call me CJ, uh, which is what you probably saw in some of the PR pushes. And um, as was mentioned, I'm a graduate student in the Department of Physics at the University of Toronto. And I also work at the Canadian Institute for Theoretical Astrophysics. Uh, I'm actually kind of like a senior graduate student, if that makes sense, because I'm getting ready to submit my PhD thesis. I'm almost done. Uh, so close, but uh, not quite, not quite Dr. Woodford yet, unfortunately. <laughs> so I'm going to be talking to you today about um, kind of my field of research and some of the really cool stuff in and around there, uh, gravitational waves. And one of the nicknames that they've gotten over the last couple of years, called, which is Sirens of the Universe. So let's get started. I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about myself first, like where, um, where I'm coming from with this. I'm actually not from Ontario. I'm from Newfoundland and Labrador, which is the easternmost province in Canada. Um, it's not a great image, I know, but I wanted it to, uh, to be pretty simple. It's also not a great projection of the world, but here we are. So I'm actually from this little, um, this little island off the, off the coast. And I'm actually from like the easternmost part of that island, pretty much. So grew up um, essentially in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, uh, fun times. And this is my home community. Um, and I call it a community. I didn't grow up in a city or a town even. Uh, this is called Harbor, Maine. I actually grew up in the neighboring community called Trappos Cove. There wasn't a great aerial uh, photo of that one. Um, but this is really what it looks like. This, there isn't some big um, amount of houses off screen. Like this is what it looks like. And for reference, um, in my community, um, which included Harbor, Maine, the video, in the photo that you're seeing here, there's only about 300 people in total. Um, my high school, uh, from kindergarten all the way through grade 12, only had about 250 to 300 people in total. And it serviced um, actually about a 50 kilometer radius of several different communities that were kind of hard to get to. So I grew up kind of in a rural area. Uh, not as rural as some places in Newfoundland, but still pretty rural. It wasn't a city, it wasn't a town. Um, and I really think that growing up in this area with my, and particularly because my parents were so supportive of my interest in physics and math um, and space, that I was able to focus a lot of time on that as a kid. And, you know, light pollution certainly wasn't a problem out in the middle of nowhere in Newfoundland. So we had really great views of the sky. Um, I definitely attribute that to my interest in space and, and graduating high school, going to the Memorial University of Newfoundland for my undergraduate degree in physics and mathematics. And when I did that, so spending most of my life in Newfoundland, I came to Ontario and I jumped right into my PhD. So I didn't do a master's because I knew I wanted to, to do a lot of research. And as was mentioned, I now work at the University of Toronto and I'm part of the University of Toronto Physics Department and the Canadian Institute for Theoretical Astrophysics. Uh, so that's just like a little bit about me. I've been living here since 2015. And as I said, I'm getting ready to um, submit my thesis now in the, in the, next, in the next month or so, uh, so, hopefully this week, but we'll see. And the important part here, this was also pushed on the social media. The most important part of me coming to Toronto was having my dog. Uh, his name is Chip. It's very important. <laughs> and 
this is Chip looking at a laptop and he's looking at some gravitational waves on the, on the laptop and he's saying, I don't understand, what the hey is this? And maybe you're saying that too. Maybe you're in the same boat as my beautiful dog, Chip. Um, you're probably not as cute as my dog, Chip, and that's okay. But if you're just as confused as he is about gravitational waves, then luckily for you, we have Chip's list to learn about gravitational waves. And this is what we're gonna talk about today. So the very first thing we gotta talk about when we're talking about gravitational waves, the word gravity is in there. We gotta learn about gravity. We gotta figure out um, what is gravity and a big part of, of gravity is then knowing about general relativity. And we'll see where that link comes in as we talk through it. Once we know a little bit more about gravity and general relativity, we can then start thinking about, okay, well, where do the gravitational waves come in? What causes them? Uh, what happens to get these signals, these sirens of the universe as we're calling them? And then what are those gravitational waves? How do we detect them? And what have we detected so far? So we have five main points that we wanna to get to, and this is gonna be our starting point, our, our bouncing board um, for Chip's list to learn about, about uh, gravitational waves in general relativity. And I just wanna preface this also by saying that I'm not the first person to come onto Cosmos from your couch and uh, talk about gravita gravitational waves or general relativity. Um, so Dr. Katie Brevik also came on and talked about it. She's one of my colleagues here at the Canadian Institute for Theoretical Astrophysics. Uh, she's a postdoctoral um, colleague associate. And she gave a talk back in March titled Whispers from the Cosmos. So kind of similar uh, titles. And we are talking about the same thing, gravitational waves. But um, I'm coming at it from a little bit different perspective, as we'll see later on. But if you're watching this sometime in the future, uh, so not live, I would actually recommend you go watch her talk uh, first, just to have some sense of um, chronology. But if you're watching this live and you haven't seen Katie's talk, it's totally fine to go back and watch that another time. It'll give you a really interesting dual perspective on the same phenomenon of gravitational waves. So definitely go check that out. It's also on the Dunlap Cosmos Money Couch website, but here's the link as well. I could do a card if I could actually edit this video. All right, so first part, what is gravity and what is general relativity? And what I'm showing you is a simulation of essentially that. And we're jumping right in here. I'm gonna, we're gonna talk about each part of this very slowly over the next little while that we have together um, during the stream. So what we have going on in the simulation are two black holes. So two black holes together is called a binary black hole and they're orbiting around each other. The multicolored kind of rainbow colored um, surface that they're on is what we call space time. And we're gonna get into what space time is in a second, but for now, just take me at my word, it's space time. And on the very bottom, we have the waveform and the waveform here is the actual gravitational wave. The idea is that as these black holes orbit around each other, uh, they're losing energy that's getting lost as gravitational waves, and they eventually merge when they're close enough together. And the space time around them gets really, really extremely uh, curved and twisted, as you can see here in this merger where it's frozen. And then it settles down, the space time calms down, and you can see off in the distance, there's gravitational waves exiting in this magenta hue and blue pattern. So this is everything. Everything we're gonna talk about is actually just in that video. And now we're gonna break it down. So let's wind it back. So we talked about the simulation. Uh, we talked a little bit about space time. Let's think about space time a little bit more. That's usually the tricky concept when we talk about general relativity and simulations of, of uh, gravitational waves. So space time is essentially everything. It's our fabric of space and time. So, um, Everybody's pretty familiar that we live in a three-dimensional space. We have a length, a height, and a width to all objects, even ones that are really, really thin or something like this. Um, and then, so taking all of those, those three dimensions, length, height, and width, and combining it with the dimension of time. And once you have that weaved together, that's essentially our universe. Our universe is space-time. Um, so I'll be using the word space time to refer to essentially the fabric of the universe on which everything exists. And I know that's kind of like a weird thing to wrap your head around, um, but that we need a word for it and that's the word we're gonna use. So what happens to space time in particular, um, as I've shown here, as I'm showing here on the screen, we have to sometimes take an analogy of it because we can't really imagine things happening in four dimensions, which is what the time part would imply. So we simpli simplify it down, make it easy, 
and we're saying, okay, space time acts kind of like a rubber sheet. And that's what this green uh, grid is representing here on this image. So this green grid is the space time. And on the space time in this particular example is our sun, you know, the glowing orange yellow thing in the sky, burning gas or rather nuclear fusion. And the other thing on the screen here, that little blue dot on the, <laughs> on the right hand side for me um, is Earth. And the thing that we want to pay attention here in this analogy is that the sun is causing a really deep curvature in space time. It's bending space time a lot and a lot more than what we see Earth is doing. So Earth is also bending space time, but not as much as the sun. This is a really important concept. Uh, the, this concept of matter tells space time how to curve. And this curvature, this dip, in space time when objects with mass are existing in it is essentially how we explain gravity through general relativity. So, you know, general relativity in two minutes, there you go, curvature of space time. And I believe Katie said something similar in her talk as well. So the other part though, is that um, space time tells matter how to move. So this curvature in space time, uh, especially with the sun creating a larger dip than the earth, causes the earth to orbit around the sun as opposed to the sun orbiting around the earth. You can kind of think about this like if you have a big trampoline and you put a bowling ball in the middle of the trampoline and you threw a tennis ball onto that trampoline, unless you throw it really, really hard, um, you know, maybe don't do that, but unless you throw it super hard, uh, what's going to happen to the tennis ball is that it's going to orbit around or go around that bowling ball on that trampoline. Eventually it'll go down to the center and Earth doesn't do that. Earth is not going to fall into the sun, folks. Um, but the ideas are similar. It's a similar kind of physics that's happening. But we're not here to talk about stars. We're not here to talk about the planets. I'm not here to tell you about how Earth orbits the sun or about our solar system. Um, I'm not even here to talk about stars in general. What I want to talk about when we talk about gravitational waves is actually the more extreme cases of objects in our universe that can contribute very strongly to gravitational wave science. And those are what we call exotic objects. So things like our neutron stars and black holes, words that you may have heard before, but I'm going to go into how those form and, um, and what we see with them. All right, so how do these exotic objects form? Well, we actually gotta talk about stellar evolution first. I know, I wasn't gonna talk about stars, but you can't talk about black holes really without talking about the stars. That's just how it is. So, <laughs> you don't know how a star forms, here we go, buckle up. So with stellar evolution, uh, every star starts in kind of a stellar nursery. And you can kind of think about that like a nebula, which is shown here on screen. This nebula, all that's happening in it, so you have lots of gas and dust particles. Over time, actually due to the gravity of those little, little tiny gas and dust particles, they clump together. And over long periods of time, enough will clump together to form a star. All right, so let's look at that, that case. So enough clumps together to create a low or medium mass star. Now, the reason I'm starting with this one is because low and medium mass stars are the most common type of star. We just consider our Milky Way galaxy, uh, low and medium mass stars, which look like the sun, by the way, the sun is what we call a kind of a, a mid, maybe low mid mass star. Um, they account for approximately 80-ish percent, maybe even a little bit more of this, all, out of all of the stars in the Milky Way galaxy. And there's probably similar numbers um, for a lot of the large galaxies in our universe. So these low and medium mass stars are really, really common. They're everywhere. <laughs> Eventually though, they don't, they don't just stay this way forever. Um, they are gonna change as they burn up their fuel and go through the main sequence, which is a, uh, a nifty way of categorizing stars. So eventually these low and medium mass stars will go red giant. This is just another phase of their evolution uh, as they get older and use up their fuel. And red giants um, don't typically, or maybe not ever uh, go supernova. So when they run out of fuel completely, they'll turn into what we call a planetary nebula. Now these planetary nebula can also, you know, create more stars because they're just gas and dust again, and they're more likely to create things like solar systems, um, which is fun. However, the core of that red giant, um, as it turns into this planetary nebula, is going to condense down and not form new stars and not turn into gas and dust. So instead, it's going to create a white dwarf. All right, cool. Now we know where white dwarfs come from, but I'm not here to talk to you about white dwarfs. So this is just what happens to a lot of stars or maybe most stars. 
Um, but to get to our neutron stars and black holes, we actually have to consider what happens when you have really high mass stars uh, from, these, from these stellar nurseries, from these nebula. So you have really high mass stars now, maybe 30 or 50 or 80 times the mass of our sun, absolutely massive. And these would be things kind of like Betelgeuse, if you've um, ever heard of that one before. It's kind of hard not to hear about Betelgeuse if you like astronomy. If you haven't heard about Betelgeuse before, please, please look it up. It's a, gonna go supernova any second. It's kind of a really interesting case, but back on topic here. So high mass stars, um, you know, many times the mass of our sun, they, when they burn through their fuel and evolve, they're gonna go red supergiant. Not red giant, red supergiant. I know we're really inventive with these names. Um, now red supergiants are the ones that go supernova. So they're gonna have these fantastic explosions. Uh, they're really, really bright, can be seen from Earth from almost anywhere in our, in our galaxy. It's pretty wild. But when the center of that supernova um, condenses and reforms, you're either gonna, you're gonna have one of two things. You're gonna have a neutron star or a black hole. So the difference here is how big is that core? How big was the original star and how big is the core of that star once it goes supernova? And if it's on the lower side, it'll become a neutron star. And neutron stars are bananas. Um, we don't actually know what's inside a neutron star. We know that they're something like the density um, of the nucleus of an atom, which is wild, um, really, really dense, some of the densest material we know about. And that's what a neutron star, at least the outside of it is made out of. But they're, so, they're such extreme objects that we don't know um, what the interior of those stars look like. And it's really difficult to find out because they are so extreme. And if you have a lot of mass in that core, instead of a neutron star, it'll actually form a black hole, which is essentially a rip in space time itself. You can't get much more extreme than that. Um, so extreme that light can't even escape the black hole, which makes it really difficult to observe. So now we know where these really extreme objects come from uh, that we would be really interested in seeing gravitational waves from, in particular, the neutron star and the black hole, because they are kind of unknown. Um, we don't know a huge amount about them per se, especially not from regular astronomy observation techniques. Uh, so techniques like using telescopes, they're really difficult to see, especially the black holes. All right, so how does this play back to our understanding of space-time? So as space-time uh, creases or creates little curves, the thing to keep in mind here when we talk about extreme objects with that is we consider it as increasing mass and decreasing size. For anyone who um, is familiar with this quantity, it's called density. So increasing density is what we're concerned with here. But the more mass you fit into the less amount of space, um, the more extreme that curvature in space-time is gonna be. So again, thinking about our example of that bowling ball and the tennis ball, the bowling ball has more mass, but if you, you know, whittle down the bowling balls or the size of a tennis ball, it's still be, it would still be heavier, it would still be more massive. And that implies that the bowling ball has more mass in a smaller amount of space than the tennis ball. It has a higher density. So thinking about that, how does the curvature of space-time change? How does gravity change as things get more dense, as we go to more extreme objects? So let's have a look at the sun. All right, yeah, we saw this before, nothing new. All right, cool. Little curvature uh, allows the solar system to exist, it's nice. But as we increase our mass and our density, so maybe something like a white dwarf will look like this one something like a neutron star, we look like this one, we're getting pretty extreme curvatures now. When we get to a black hole, it's the most extreme type of curvature we can kind of fathom. And realistically, this curvature should probably go right down through my screen, but you know, artist, artistic interpretations um, are what they are. So the black hole is the most extreme curving of space-time um, out of all the types of astronomical objects that we're aware of. I'm aware the sun is not doing me any favors right now, sorry. <laughs> All right, so let's come back to this picture. Uh, we'll go from our simple picture back to a little bit, a little bit nicer picture with the, uh, the green grid of space-time. So the sun curves space-time, so does everything with mass, but it's not as extreme as some of our more exotic objects like neutron stars and black holes. And the two things we really wanna take away from this part is um, that space-time tells matter how to move and matter tells space-time how to bend um, or how to curve. So as space-time curves, matter will follow that curvature in space-time, but the matter itself, the mass itself, 
will also cause curvature in spacetime. Now, this also can simplify down to what we know um, and maybe are used to, like Newton's laws of gravity. But this is the more general approach to gravity, especially when we're considering extreme cases, um, again, like the neutron stars and the black holes. So let's move on to this idea of gravitational waves. So what we're showing here is a video of two exotic objects. I'm interpreting them to be neutron stars. And they are orbiting around each other. So now this is different. This is not a singular neutron star hanging out by itself in the universe. This one has a, has a buddy, it's a friend. <laughs> and these friends are orbiting around each other. They're both causing curvature in space-time and they're following the space-time from the curvature that the other is causing. Um, and as they move, those curves don't just disappear, they ripple outwards. So the same way that um, we call gravitational waves, the sirens of the universe are whispers from the cosmos, they also can be called and are called oftentimes uh, ripples in space-time. It's this rippling effect. And you can actually see this a similar type of physics. You put two sticks in a pond or in a body of water and you move them around each other, you'll see ripples floating out. And that's the same kind of mechanics with gravitational waves. Now, gravitational waves might be a little bit more difficult and certainly are a lot harder to see, um, but it is, it's essentially the same effect if you're trying to get a better grasp on it. The other thing I wanna emphasize here with gravitational waves is that it's not only extreme objects that can uh, cause gravitational waves. So as long as you have matter, which is curving space-time, and it's moving through space-time, you essentially get gravitational waves regardless. So we're gonna do an experiment together. And again, if you're watching this sometime in the future, feel free to follow along. Um, especially for those of you watching live right now, we're gonna take our arms. And I want you to be careful uh, not to hit anything around you. In particular, if you're in the family setting, don't hit your siblings. It's not a good look. <laughs> so we're gonna be careful not to hit anybody or anything, especially anything breakable like another person and we're gonna take our arms and we're going to wave them back and forth just do it just wave them back and forth fast as you can all right we're gonna stop um try and get out of the sun <laughs> all right so that waving back and forth our arms are made of matter they're made of mass and they're telling space-time how to bend a, a little bit because we're not actually all that massive as like humans um but we did cause some gravitational waves, little ones, really, really tiny ones, not as strong as the ones being shown here on this video, but we still cause them. So matter moving through space-time can cause gravitational waves. And the stronger ones are caused by these really dense, really extreme objects curving space-time a lot that, we're able, that they're, they're making larger gravitational waves. Now, as I've also mentioned previously, this idea of space-time being like a tarp or a rubber sheet is an analogy. That's not actually what it looks like. So what does a gravitational wave actually look like or what happens? So one example is this little, um, another GIF I put up here. And the idea here is that as these gravitational waves move through other matter, so say for example, Earth, because um, we're gonna get to detection here in a second, um, so as they move through, what happens with them is they'll stretch, they'll stretch things in one direction and they'll compress them in another. You can see this both in a diagonal and linear case here. And that stretching and compressing is the, is the telltale sign of a gravitational wave passing through. So it's not actually going to look like a ripple per se, um, but it is still a physical event. All right, what would that look like if they actually passed through Earth though? This is the big question. So here's Earth and these green waves are the gravitational waves from some object far off in the universe. And you can see it's stretching in one direction and compressing in another, causing the Earth to wiggle. And then if a lot of them pass through, it'll wiggle extra, like a lot. <laughs> and I just wanna point out, especially on the bottom uh, left corner here, that the scale of this effect is vastly exaggerated. Um, if gravitational waves were this extreme as they pass through Earth, uh, Earth wouldn't be here anymore, nor would a lot of things in the universe. Um, we'd all be dead. It would be so extreme. So it's not this extreme, but this is just communicating the point that things kind of stretch in one direction, compress in the other, and wiggle when um, gravitational waves pass through. So not like not as not as extreme as this, but this is uh, essentially what happens. All right. Now we're gonna take a body break. We're gonna get up and we're gonna stretch. We're not gonna do that. 
Um, we're just gonna have a recap break. We're gonna summarize what we've learned so far. So we now know a little bit more about gravity and general relativity. We know about space time. We know that um, space time tells matter how to move. And we know that matter tells space time how to curve. We know that that curvature in space time is essentially the gravity is essentially gravity, or it's what causes gravitational effects. Um, we know that gravitational waves are caused by matter moving through space time, and in particular, they're caused by two relatively um, exotic objects moving around each other pretty fast. But that doesn't have to be the only case; those are just the cases that might that have really strong gravitational waves. And gravitational waves themselves are this ripple in space time, this stretching in one direction and compressing in another, um, causing stuff to wiggle as they pass through. All right, so that's our, that's our recap break uh, for right now. Recap break. All right, so the next part of this in uh, Chip's list to learn gravitational waves is how do we detect them? And again, if you've watched Katie's talk, you already know a little bit about LIGO. So we're gonna go a little bit more into technical side, like what's in LIGO kind of deal. So LIGO stands for the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. And uh, those are a lot of words <laughs> put together in this acronym. But essentially, the two that I want to focus on with you is that we already know what a gravitational wave is. Observatory should be self-explanatory. Uh, the laser interferometer part might be the part that's a little scary. So lasers are um, just forms of light that are really, really uniform. Uh, shout out to my Science 910 class you should know what a laser is. It was on your final exam. And an interferometer essentially is a observation technique that uses lasers and optics to look for physical events. So kind of broad, kind of general, but that's really what it's for. And it's, we're using a laser interferometer, using laser, which is a really powerful uniform kind of light, and then using it with fancy optics, mirrors, and lenses to then detect gravitational waves. And that's it. So it doesn't look like a regular observatory. There's no telescope. Um, and the two in LIGO are in Hanford, uh, Washington, and Livingston, Louisiana. We also have Virgo. So this is actually part of the LIGO-Virgo collaboration. These, um, all three detectors are considered as part of the same network, and they are part of the same network. And this one is in Casino, which is just outside of Pisa in Italy. So if you're gonna to go to the leading tower of Pisa, you should go to Casina and go do a tour at Virgo. I don't know if they'll, I don't know if they do tours, but they should. <laughs> and one thing I wanna to take a pause here and just talk about why these, why these detectors are shaped the way they're shaped. So in all three pictures, uh, the landscapes are very different. Um, Hanford, Washington has nothing around it. Um, the, the Virgo one has like fields um, and that sort of thing. And, the one in Livingston, Louisiana is essentially in the middle of the bayou, um, like in a swamp. So that's fun. Uh, and, but all of them kind of have the same shape. They have um, a hub in the center, and then they got two arms that go out at a 90 degree angle from each other, a right angle from each other. And the ones in Hanford, Washington, and Livingston, Louisiana, the ones in the United States, um, those arms are four kilometers long each. That's huge, <laughs> four kilometers long each. And the one in Italy, Virgo, those are about three kilometers long each. So these are really large facilities. And in each arm, essentially, it's a vacuum seal. So there's no air or anything in that arm. They have some mirrors and they have some beam splitters and some cool optic stuff. And what happens is they uh, create a very powerful laser beam in this main hub in the center and they shoot the laser down each arm. That's, that's what the arms are for. They're for shooting lasers down. Um, and I'm going to show you what that looks like, but I wanted to do a quick story time about Livingston, Louisiana first. <laughs> so uh, you might notice, again, as I mentioned, that Hanford, Washington and um, Virgo don't really have a whole lot of stuff around them. Um, it looks kind of barren or it doesn't look like you'd have an issue with people coming up to the detector or anything like that. But in Livingston, Louisiana, um, it is in the middle of the swamp and there's a lot of foliage, foliage and uh, trees around. And you can see uh, looking down one of the arms that they've cleared it out like quite significantly around the arm. And that's because even though this is not necessarily like a residential area around the detector, um, these detectors are geared to be very, very sensitive and they they're supposed to be very, very accurate. One of the issues with having such a delicate machine, however, is that it's very susceptible to noise. And that can be anything 
from transport trucks driving by to seismic activity in the Earth's crust in that particular local area, um, which is also why these three detectors are spaced so far apart, uh, so that they're not being affected by the same noise sources. But Livingston, Louisiana, while it was being while it was being tested and constructed the first time, uh, found that they had a lot of really strange interactions with uh, very loud noise. And I don't know how long it took, uh, but it was discovered that this noise that they were seeing only in Livingston, Louisiana, um, was actually from shotgun fire uh, because people were shooting crocodiles that had come too close to the detector. <laughs> so they cleared the stuff away from the, from the arm so that the crocodiles would not come as close <laughs> so that they could avoid shotgun noise. Um, in their in their detections and i have never heard a better story in my life i think that's the best thing i've ever heard um so that's a that's a fun thing so definitely when we're doing uh or you're trying to attempt really delicate science and you're making these huge detectors you have to take in a lot of um everyday kind of unexpected points to make sure that it's working the way it's supposed to work so uh you know keep that in mind louisiana is a dangerous place with crocodiles so inside the arms moving back to that one I said that the laser will go down through each one. So the beam comes from the hub. It hits a beam splitter, which just means that it splits the beam in two, goes all the way down, hits the mirrors on the other side, and comes back. Now, we know about lasers pretty well. They're, they're relatively well understood. So as this laser, this powerful laser, is exiting uh, the main part of the detector and hitting the beam splitter, and it comes back, if the arms are exactly the same length, uh, which you know by construction they are, the laser light, when it comes back to that beam splitter, should cancel out completely. There should be nothing left of that laser light. However, that's not true if the size of the arms changes in, re in relation to each other. And remember what we talked about with gravitational waves. They stretch in one direction and compress in another. So if a gravitational wave is passing through, it'll look something like this. And now it's not true that the arms are the same length. And instead, what's happening is that you have left over laser light, which is now being seen in the detector. So you're gonna come down and we, what this is showing is the wavelength of the laser light. So for anyone who's familiar with wavelengths of light, we're just showing that the peaks and troughs don't, uh, don't cancel out anymore. But the main point here is that if they're not the same length, then you're gonna have some laser light left over and that's what we consider um, a detection. Now it's not the whole story with gravitational wave, but it's certainly the beginning part. Now, so far everything I've shown you for gravitational waves has been extremely exaggerated. Uh, the scales are very, very large. So instead, what I want us to focus on for a second is just how small are these detections? So on the screen, what I'm showing you is a hydrogen atom. So the simplest atom we can make, simplest part building block of you know, matter in itself with one electron and one proton. So the proton is the blue part in the center and the electron is the pink part on the outside. So one proton, one electron, pretty simple. So we're gonna start this zoom in to see just how much do we expect these lengths to change as a gravitational wave passes through, as an average gravitational wave would pass through. Oh, there we go, play. So there's our electron whizzing around our proton. And now we're having these grids. These grids are 10 times smaller each. So 10 times smaller, 10 times smaller, 10 times smaller. We have the proton, we keep going. And then at the very edge of the proton, this is how much the lengths of the arms change. That's how much of a change you would expect to find with a when a gravitational wave passes through. That is what LIGO and Virgo are trying to find. Um, that's how small it is. So now you might understand why those uh, you know, shotgun shots were such a problem in the Livingston, Louisiana detector. So looking at how this works, this, this is actually not, um, this is not an idea that's new. And I know there's a lot of stuff going on in this image, but I just wanted to showcase uh, how impressive really the engineering side of LIGO is. Um, people like me that are, that are on like the theoretical side or the computational side of this science, um, we probably don't acknowledge or we don't talk about how intense of a technological and engineering feat these detectors are. And I really wanna give that a moment here. Um, so inside of LIGO, and LIGO was, you know, first started 
50 years ago ish. It's been it's like the idea of detecting gravitational waves in something like this has been around for a while, and it's taken that long to fine tune what would be needed to get uh, detections that small, that accurate, that fine tuned. And so what we're seeing here is what's called the suspension system. I'm not going to go into each part because the, um, the complexity of it is not what I want to get into. But the idea essentially is that you're hanging um, mirrors as well as little boosters for your, for your laser from very, very fine wire. And this suspension system was found to be the best way to not only not interfere with your laser, but also to minimize the noise in the detector when it was running. So that means even if your big tube, the big tubes that are running down four kilometers shake a little bit due to seismic activity or something like that, um, because everything's suspended in wires, uh, again, the suspension system, that should minimize the noise. So there's a lot of layers of engineering and technical work that go into making sure that LIGO works the way it's supposed to. So really, really small detection, really small detection. So shout out to the technicians who work on this because they do a fantastic job. And it takes a big team of technicians, engineers, and scientists to keep LIGO Virgo going. And I, like, you know, you have technicians and engineers on site 24 hours a day when the detectors are up. So this is um, some photos of the technicians working on some of the optics systems inside of those big tubes that LIGO is made out of. This is a person standing next to where the beam would go through so that you can have an idea of how large this is. This person's about like five, seven, five, eight. Um, and this is how large these, these tubes are. So right now these, these obviously are not running. People would not be in there when there's laser light. Um, but this is showcasing how large they are and how much work goes into upkeeping these. These are uh, the suspension systems that they're working on. And finally, as they're finalizing their tests with that suspension system in one of the arms in one of the detectors. So a lot of innovation, a lot of work, and a lot of maintenance go into these detectors. And um, big shout out to the people who work on that. Um, you do an excellent job. So with all of this fancy equipment and lots of work on the engineering side I got into it, um, there was, yes, finally a detection of gravitational waves after 50 years of kind of trying to see if they could detect it. And what I'm showing here um, is the same waveform that Chip was puzzling over right at the beginning. Um, and it's the data from gravitational wave 150914 that was detected on September 14th of 2015. Um, and this is showing you the Livingston information in blue and the Hanford information in orange. And you can see just how strong the signal was. You can pretty much see it directly, which is impressive. Now, what we're seeing when it says strain on the y-axis here, on the vertical axis, is that's how much essentially your, um, the arms of the detectors are stretching or compressing. So strain is how much they're stretching and compressing due to that gravitational wave. And time on the bottom here is on seconds, is in seconds rather. So this form, this strain is leading back to what we saw on the very, very first simulation with the rainbow uh, space time is the idea of a waveform. This is what we call a waveform. This is the gra this is the form of the gravitational wave as seen in the detector. Um, so now this is all coming together. We have our idea of space time. We know what a binary black hole is. Two black holes orbiting around each other, and now we know what the waveform is. So we're doing pretty well. So just to take one second to emphasize how big of a deal this was to actually observe um, a gravitational wave for the first time in September of 2015. It was a test for general relativity. Um, because theories are always theories and general activity is a theory, you're always trying to make sure that it either continues to work or that it's, or you're trying to make it break. And both of those things th serve the same goal. <laughs> you're trying to push science forward as much as you can by looking at really extreme systems. And there's not a whole lot more extreme than a binary black hole. So it was a test for general relativity and general relativity passed. Uh, so that's great. Continue to continue to work on our understanding of the universe. It was the very first observation of binary black holes. We knew that they were probably out there, but we hadn't actually seen them before. It was the first evidence of stellar mass black holes. So what I mean by this is that it was the first evidence of black holes that are kind of similar to the mass of our sun, um, or rather that they have masses between 10 and 100-ish times the mass of our sun. So we hadn't seen any black holes like that either. This was the first evidence of those. It was the smallest detection ever attempted and succeeded by science in general. So that includes things like 
nanotechnology and medicine. Um, this detection of binary black holes was in fact the smallest detection we've ever successfully done as a human race. Nice job, astronomy. <laughs> nice. Um, additionally, it was the most energetic event ever observed up until that point. So I'm going to move on from that. It was five years ago, but um, it was pr it was pretty bananas. And this this is what was found um, in what we call the first run and the second run. So these were all the binary black holes uh, that were confirmed, and then one potential um, one potential event, the LBT 151012. Uh, in the first couple of runs of LIGO, because they had to shut down for upgrades in between. And just to take a second to recognize that it was from these discoveries that three um, very key players in making sure that LIGO Virgo uh, came to fruition and that the detectors were online and working, the theory was there. The 2017 Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded to Rainer Weiss, Barry Barish, and Kip Thorne, going from left to right here. Um, so just a shout out there that this was a big enough deal to secure the Nobel Prize for LIGO in 2017. All right, let's do another recap break. So now we already learned about gravity and general relativity. We learned about what causes gravitational waves and we learned what gravitational waves are. And we've kind of learned about how to detect them as well as what we've detected so far. But I've only told you so far about um, the first run and the second run with LIGO and Virgo and only up until to the first detection, which happened in 2015. And that was five years ago. So what's happened since? Let's see if we can fill out what we understand about those uh, last two points a little bit further. But first of all, how do we detect? Let's focus on that one for a second. What we're seeing here is another simulation of a binary black hole. In particular, this is a simulation of GW150914, uh, the you know, flagship detection of, uh, general, of um, gravitational waves. So what we're seeing here, we have two black holes up top. We have our strain. So that's you know the strength of the gravitational wave. How much are you stretching, compressing space time in the middle? And then the bottom one is frequency. So this is kind of telling you how fast are the black holes orbiting around each other. So also remember that we're describing this middle part as the waveform. Simulations like this are key to understanding um, gravitational waves. And we wouldn't actually be able to detect them with LIGO if not for simulations, near simulations of binary black holes and other kinds of binaries uh, beforehand. Just to really drive this home, the idea of computer simulations here are really useful because you can't just, or we weren't able to just detect or go look at binary black holes. We use computer simulations as a stand-in for those observations and those detections. Uh, so it's kind of how you test various models. And with LIGO in particular, because they're so sensitive, because the detectors are so sensitive and they have so much noise most of the time, you actually need to have a pretty good idea of what you're looking for to then cross compare. And what we call that is using templates. So use templates to look for signals in the LIGO Virgo, Virgo data, as well as trying to match signals when you do see them with the templates that have already been made. Now, this particular simulation was done in what we call numerical relativity. So the numerical part just means with numbers, um, not a big surprise, and relativity implies general relativity. So we're putting general relativity onto a computer and saying start. Uh, it's not usually that easy. There's usually a lot of other stuff that goes on, but uh, essentially there you go. So, <laughs> so we use numerical relativity to have an idea of what happens. Um, and numerical relativity, take, these simulations take a really long time and they're really, really accurate. So what you then do is you use those numerical relativity simulations of these binary black holes and other objects to inform simpler, faster models that then populate the template banks in LIGO. And to give you an idea of just how many templates are made, there's over a million templates, one million templates uh, in the LIGO template bank right now. Um, not, most of them are not made with numerical relativity, very much most of them are not made with numerical relativity. But numerical relativity helped inform the models that um, those templates are made from. So some key facts there. So let's reverse just a second and think about why do we need simulations in general. So I've kind of explained why we need it in this field. Um, but you know, computer science and coding and scientific simulations didn't stem from a need, well, didn't only stem from a need 
uh, to know about binary black holes and general relativity. We see computer simulations in all kinds of science um, and in all kinds of physics and astronomy in particular. So typically, um, two main reasons, and there are other reasons, um, and I really hope my colleagues don't come for me, but two main reasons um, that I'm going to focus on here are some things are really, really hard or impossible to calculate and model with pen and paper. So this is not like your high school physics class where you're able to solve everything exactly. There are some things that you just need to model numerically and visualize in order to understand what's going on. Uh, you cannot solve it um, with a pen and like literally with a pen and paper by writing it out. We call that solving it analytically. So sometimes you need the simulations to solve the equations in the first place or understand what, what's happening. The second thing I'm gonna, I'm gonna focus on when we need simulations is that sometimes what you're looking for is really difficult to detect and having a model will help process the signal and or stand in for that signal if you're not able to make those um, experiments or observations at the moment. There's a number of different reasons why you can't do that. It depends on the area of science it is, but two of those things pop up quite a bit, um, especially in areas of physics and, uh, and chemistry as well. Happens all over the place in science, but physics and chemistry are what I see it a lot in. So we need simulations pretty much in everything. And we can kind of think about this by linking it back to the scientific method. Now, I'm not gonna focus a whole lot on the scientific method, because uh, I think we learned it in grade three, um, for the most part. If you haven't learned it in grade three, I'm sorry. <laughs> but the idea is that you um, might ask a question, you do some background research to see if someone else has asked that question. Normally this question is fueled by looking at observations, by the way, so that's the part that's missing. You will construct a hypothesis. What do you think is happening? You'll test your hypothesis with an experiment or with observations in the case of astronomy and physics a lot of the time. From that experiment, you will you're analyze your results and you're gonna make a conclusion about what you saw. And from that conclusion, you can say, okay, my hypothesis was true. What I thought was gonna happen did happen or it was false or partially true, such as it didn't happen the way I expected it, or it kind of happened the way I expected it, but this weird thing also occurred. So if it's that second part, false or partially true, then you gotta go back, think again about what could be happening and go back and reevaluate that hypothesis. And the very last thing, uh, regardless of whether hypothesis was true or not, you wanna report those results so that if someone else comes across this question or something similar, they will also find your work and your experiments and your thoughts when they do that background research. And that's kind of where the scientific community comes from, this uh, reporting your results and doing your background researching. So this is on like an individual level. Each individual scientist does this uh, routinely day in and day out. <laughs> and even small groups of collaborators will do this as well. When we think about huge collaborations or even large areas of science, um, the scientific method can kind of, is not quite broken down exactly this way because everyone's already doing this. So it's actually a bit larger. So on a large scale, we can think about it like theory, observations, and experiments. So your observations lead to your theory. Your theory will inform your experiments. So this is where your hypothesis comes in. You're gonna, your theory informs your experiments. And then you're gonna analyze that stuff from those experiments. So that would be like drawing your conclusions. And then from there, you would lead it back to theory. So theory here is kind of taking the place of our hypothesis. It's a larger body of work um, that's more cohesive or understandable. But this is not really how it works for most groups nowadays. So I'm just gonna move over theory. We also have simulations that we can fall onto and simulations kind of model up the works, but they are an integral part of it. And it means that we might be able to get around or understand more from these experiments and observations. So your observations um, can also lead to simulations. So theory and experiments inform your simulations. So, whoop, went backwards. So you got another arrow here. All right. Your simulations also inform your experiments and analysis, however. So we got an added arrow there, okay. And your simulations also inform your theory because they are also kind of like your experiments in some cases. So we have to also add an arrow here. Now our diagram has gotten a little messy, um, but simulations here, I hope you can see, um, can sometimes accent or take the place of experiment and observation if necessary, or they can assist with the experiment when possible. So simulation part here, this computational simulations um, that a lot of areas do now can be really, really essential. And what I'm showing now are these simulations specifically for gravitational waves as they were applied to some of the gravitational wave events seen in the first and second observation run with LIGO. 
So these detections were confirmed with the detector and then they were ran again um, using parameters in a simulation to confirm them and learn more about them. All right, but you don't just want uh, simulations of binary black holes. So there are other types of binaries that can cause gravitational waves. And as we mentioned way, way back, neutron stars can do that. And this is a simulation of two neutron stars merging and uh, you know exploding because neutron stars are made out of matter. They're not just rips in space time. So they're gonna have some funky stuff go on with them. So what's cool about the binary neutron star part is that not only can you see them in gravitational waves, you can see them in light. And what I'm showing here on the screen is um, a part of a paper that was published for the very first binary neutron star detection. Uh, the very first one was first found in LIGO Virgo. And we can actually follow the timeline here. So the timeline is going from left to right and the type of detection is going from the top to the bottom. So the gravitational waves were detected first. The gravitational wave detection then alerted a telescope called Fermi to look at the gamma ray information. And then from there, other telescopes that look at other kinds of light were then able to look at that part of the sky and get more and more detailed information about what happened with this binary neutron star. So in this case, not only did we see something in gravitational waves, you saw it with light too. So in this case, we're using our eyes and our ears. If you wanna be, um, be cute about it, you're seeing the event and you're hearing the event. This was a big detection and this kind of work takes a lot of collaboration and communication. So it was the three detectors for gravitational waves, uh, LIGO and Virgo. So two LIGO detectors in Virgo, as well as a number of telescopes all across the globe and in space. And those are represented by the blue dots here on the diagram. Some really cool stuff that happens from gravitational waves is not just learning about general relativity, um, but also learning more about science in general. And particularly from this binary neutron star merger, we actually were able to confirm a little bit more about the periodic table and elements that came from it. So we didn't know where all these elements came from. And then we saw this binary neutron star and saw evidence of them existing. So that's nice. So we are running out of time here. I'm going a little over, but uh, this particular one gave us a lot more information about astronomy as well, about chemistry and the foundations and building blocks of our universe. But I wanna focus on this very last part, this bolded uh, button at the bottom. It was the beginning of multi-messenger astronomy. So listening as well as looking for events in the universe uh, that help us understand more. So LIGO's detected a ton of stuff since. This is not a cohesive calendar. This is just the one I was able to find. Um, and when they started their 03 run in 2019, uh, they were starting to detect things on a not quite daily basis, but certainly a couple every week. And there's been 50 confirmed detections uh, since. Now, there's been a lot of candidates, a lot of things that they think are gravitational waves, but 50 of them have been absolutely confirmed as real detections, um, which is a really exciting development. And there's a lot more science to be done here. So with that, I'm happy to take questions. And I'm also gonna leave these links up on the screen in case you're interested in LIGO, SXS, simulating extra space times with my collaboration, which does um, numerical activity simulations, as well as the CETA website and the CETA Twitter handle. So thank you so much for listening. Amazing. Thank you so much, CJ. That was that was really great. That was a lot of fun. And such always, you know, with gravitational waves, etc. There's always such amazing images included. I just remember it as well with um, with Dr. Brevik's talk, always like just such beautiful like animations and computer simulations. Um, so we do have a couple of questions. Uh, Reagan Johnson is asking, how much does the Earth's kind of stretch or on a regular basis? Maybe that's a bit of a big question, but. <laughs> how much does the Earth stretch on a regular basis? Uh, not enough, it has a stiff neck. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm joking. So that's actually a really good question, Reagan. I don't, I'm not making fun of you. Um, so we actually have a lot of gravitational wave events that pass through Earth like, regu like regularly. Um, and something that Katie talked about in her talk, again, make sure to go check that out if you haven't seen it. Um, she mentioned some of our updated rates of occurrence. So it's expected that in particular for binary neutron stars, which happen you know, fairly quickly, the gravitational wave of those pass through Earth, um, or maybe not pass through Earth, but occur every 30 seconds. And from binary black holes, it occurs every like five days or so. 
uh, which is a lot. And so a lot of those gravitational waves do pass through Earth, um, but not all of them are what LIGO can detect. And a lot of them are probably really, really, really weak, like weaker than what we talked about with that proton model. Um, but in general, I'm gonna refer back to that proton model. The Earth stretches and compresses about as much as one one thousandth the diameter of a proton. Um, so that's otherwise, if you want to use scientific notation, I don't know how old Reagan is, uh, but if you want to use scientific notation, uh, that would be 10 to the negative 21 meters. Um, if you want, if you want some serious numbers. That's very specific. <laughs> as the non, as a resident non-astronomer, wow, that is very specific. So we um, have a couple questions and always at the end that they start to come in. Um, uh, Sagan, I'm guessing this user's name, maybe after Carl Sagan, um, says, I got here late. Can you explain interferometry or oh, okay. give kind of a, yeah. Yeah, so Sagan, uh, you didn't miss too much because I glossed over it. <laughs> this wasn't an optic <laughs> stuff. Um, but to give you a little bit more insight into what that means, um, an interferometer is essentially using light in some way. So in this case, we were using talking about laser interferometers, so they're going to use laser light. So it uses light and optics to make a detection. And I know that sounds super general, but that is literally their definition. You're using light and what we know about optics to make an observation about the physical world around us. Um, and we use it a lot, actually, I don't say we, I used to work in a chemistry group, which is why I say we, uh, but it's used a lot in chemistry as well as in uh, biology and medicine to detect particular compounds in, um, in solutions and in particular in blood. So you can use interferometry for that as well. But in this case, we're using laser light to detect gravitational waves. So huge number of applications. Cool, amazing. Um, uh, Lena is asking, and she's thanking you as well as our uh, numerous other people, but um, she is asking, uh, she's wondering if there are any theories about gravitational waves that can slow time on Earth. Okay, yeah, so this is something that we don't, uh, we don't talk about usually in, um, so first of all, great question, uh, but it's not something we normally talk about in um, general knowledge talks like this because the idea of time dilation, which is something that happens with general relativity, it's a, it's a measured of, uh, effect, uh, does happen with gravitational waves, but it's um, a little bit harder to wrap your head around, a little bit harder to explain. Uh, so what I'll say instead is, I'll explain what time dilation is just quickly. So the idea is that you know gravitational waves are an effect from general relativity, and in general relativity and also special relativity, there's an effect um, called time dilation. So the slowing of time is what you're referring to that as. So um, if you ever had your eyes dilated, your pupils get big, all that dilation just means larger, growing. Uh, so the unit of time gets bigger, time dilation. Mm -hmm. And the, the idea of the unit gets bigger, the time slows down. Um, and where that's probably best seen is actually with astronauts in orbit or in the ISS um, or with you know other orbital satellites we'll see time dilation between what they're experiencing and what we're experiencing. It's very, very slight, um, fairly perceptible, not perceptible to us, but perceptible to uh, instrumentation, um, that there is time dilation happening because they're a little bit further away and they're moving a little bit faster. They're, trying, they're not getting into the general relativistic uh, scale at all, but it's just faster than us enough for, for there to be a little bit of time dilation there. Um, so there is an effect with gravitational waves, but I think it really goes beyond the scope of, uh, of this year. I wouldn't be able to summarize it very well. So I apologize for that. <laughs> I mean, thank you. That was great. Thank you. Um, Fridell Brief asks, are there gravitational wave detectors up in space as well? Or are they only on the ground? OK, so Dal, um, I wish. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, something that um, happens a lot in astronomy in general is uh, you'll have a really great idea for a detector to go into space. And this is not just for LIGO, Virgo. Um, this is for pretty much every part of astronomy. And it'll get delayed for launch, delayed for launch, delayed for launch. And then it's like 15 years later and you're running out of budget and it's like, oh no. <laughs> so uh, JWST, I see you. Um, but the idea, particularly with uh, in space or orbital uh, gravitational wave detectors is that there isn't one right now, um, but there is one designed and being 
made and being tested and hopefully it will eventually uh, get into space. Um, the timeline just keeps getting bumped and bumped and bumped and bumped. Uh, so I, I really can't even give you a, a timeline, but I can tell you it's called ELISA. So uh, L-I-S-A, and there's usually an E in front of it, so ELISA. And it is designed to go into space and it's not gonna detect the same kind of gravitational waves that we see with LIGO Virgo. Um, instead, it'll detect gravitational waves that are um, a little bit louder, but a lot slower. So this, these would be from what we call supermassive black holes orbiting around each other. So like galaxy mergers and supernova explosions would be detectable from ELISA, but it's planned. Uh, it has some great engineering and technical work done behind it, but it, the launch date keeps getting pushed and there's other issues. So can't tell you when that's gonna happen. I mean, that's, that's like much of science and academia and space, yeah. you know, things, you know, <laughs> things have their own timeline. Um, somebody is asking about LIGO specifically, is LIGO directional? Oh, yes, very perceptive. Uh, so <laughs> yes, uh, the surface of the earth is fixed. We cannot change where the surface of the earth is pointing at any one time. And unfortunately the detectors are, um, you know, sitting on the surface of the earth. They're not movable like uh, satellite dishes or like mm -hmm. um, um, electromagnetic or rather light telescopes would be able to see. So that's a very perceptive question. Thank you. Um, so they are directional and they depend on where that part of the earth is pointing at that period of time. Now, keep in mind, this is also why um, I've been saying all three detectors together. And Virgo did come online a little bit later, but there's always at least been the two detectors in the United States on at the same time. The United States is a pretty large landmass and they're on like two opposite ends of it. So they're actually not pointing in the same direction and the arms are not pointing in the same direction either. Um, I don't know if I'm reflected for you, so I'm not gonna try and simulate it. Um, but if you go to the LIGO link that I put at the end of the talk, they'll actually, they have a lot of nice graphics showing you exactly how, what the positions are relative to each other. So they are directional and they're directional so that you can have a better triangulation of where that gravitational wave is coming from and you can get more information out of it. What I mean by triangulation is um, that if you can get information at two different points that are a certain distance away from each other, then you can trace that back and pinpoint where the original source came from. That's how our ears work and it's also how GPS satellites work as well. Uh, so it's the same kind of idea using physics that we're already comfortable with um, to try and figure out where the gravitational wave is coming from and it's completely dependent on the directionality of those detectors at the time. Ooh, that's good. Yeah, I mean, because we all understand, you know, GPS in our car or on, like on our phones that, you know, that's, yeah, yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. Oh, um, I'll actually add one thing to that answer. Sorry, Kara. Yes, yes, um, of so course. Since you mentioned no. GPS in your car, uh, if you think about GPS uh, in your car or on your phone, it's like the more satellites you have, and maybe you'll have something on your, on your phone that tells you that, the more satellites you have, the better your um, signal, the better your... Um, detail of location is. Exact same thing works for LIGO Virgo. Uh, so the more detectors we have online, the better we see the signal to some extent and the better we know where that signal is coming from. Um, so actually exactly the same as your GPS um, triangulation. It's really interesting. And we do have detectors coming out, hopefully uh, being built in Japan as well as in Indo India. So there's LIGO India and then there's um, Kagra in Japan. So hopefully that'll really boost our ability to see these gravitational waves. Oh, cool. Interesting. Yeah. Sorry for um, no, of course. No, of course. You're <laughs> we're all learning from you this evening. Um, Somebody is asking if the moon fell um, moon affects calculations of gravitational waves at all. Right. So, I mean, if the moon would have an effect, I think it would have a larger effect maybe on for a detector um, that was like close to a shoreline or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, and the only reason I say that is because the moon really affects our tides, right? They affect um, our oceanic tides. It also affects our atmosphere and this sort of thing, but we're not here for my atmospheric physics talk. Um, so <laughs> That's a whole nother, yeah, yeah. That's a whole, That's nother, a whole nother night. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the idea with the moon is that it, it doesn't actually affect things on Earth to the extent that you might imagine it to. So it, it affects our water and affects the, and affects the atmosphere, which are really large effects. But um, in terms of detections for things like gravitational waves, the moon is not a big deal, not a big deal. So it might affect the noise level um, that a detector experiences, but it will not affect how that gravitational wave is detected in the detector itself. So it could affect the noise, but it's not gonna affect the detection. Mm, okay, so yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Um, 
we have another question. Um, this person seems to very much know their astronomy. We love, we love, we love that here. Um, so um, a, he asked, so a gravitational wave front that arrives oriented to be parallel to LIGO, would it miss seeing the wave if it's parallel or? Yeah. Yeah, it would. Okay. Yeah, but that being said, so again, I'm gonna link back to that triangulation, um, like directionality of the detectors. A, a gravitational wave can't be parallel to all three at the same time. So, ah, so you can certainly have some, one somebody's spot. gonna catch it. Yeah, somebody's, somebody's gonna and, catch it. At least yeah. two. The, the ideal scenario would be that you have all you haven't seen all three detectors. Um, mm -hmm. but if you have that instance where a gravitational wave um, essentially passes a uh, detector by, um, then that means that the detector had a blind spot. And fun fact, Virgo had a blind spot for the binary neutron star detection, um, GW170817. And they were still able to confirm that detection with LIGO and Virgo data. Cool, cool, okay. no, I love that. Um, somebody, um, Carolyn, thank you for your question, Carolyn, is asking, um, does the University of Toronto have an extent of, or are they involved in LIGO on a regular basis? So uh, I think myself and Katie have given a very uh, warped view of the gravitational wave work done at U of T. Um, we are the only two people, as far as I know, working on gravitational wave stuff. And uh, there is actually no principal investigator, or what we call a PI uh, for LIGO here. So we don't have a LIGO connection at the University of Toronto or in Canada right now at all. Um, wow. At all, yeah. So I'm, I was not, I'm not involved in LIGO. My supervisor so a couple of years ago was involved, um, but he since left the University of Toronto. I had to switch supervisors. And uh, Katie's not a PI. So we don't have anyone here that actually belongs to LIGO. And we don't have anyone who could even start really a collaboration with LIGO unless they decided to switch their research field almost entirely. Um, so we've had two talks on gravitational waves, but um, nobody's actually related to LIGO directly. <laughs> Cool. I mean, you guys are you guys are a very rare breed, and and I mean the you know our departments are are very small. Some of these you know departments like Dunlap and and CETA, et cetera. It's a very rare breed of amazing people that we have. Um, oh, and yes, we have a thank you for your um, for your uh, Sagan says thank you. He says he he sort of understands a thing. That's always. That's always the goal here. We want people to understand a thing. I love that. Um, I'm, oh, somebody is asking a gravity question. Um, and you may not be the best person to answer, but I'll, I'll hit you with it. Um, and you can just let me know. Um, can you explain the tidal stuff at all that you, that you mentioned, like tidal locking a moon to keep one face pointed to the planet this person really knows they're 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 challenging you cj yeah no uh, so actually i know quite a bit about this because um i actually worked in exoplanets for about eight months and tidal locking is the right way to say that so tidal locking uh is really common we think with exoplanetary systems um so jokes on you i actually know how to answer this. <laughs> <laughs> jokes yeah <laughs> um yeah, so it's not it's not quite uh, related to uh, general relativity and gravitational waves per se, but it is still a gravity question. Uh, so that's mm -hmm. really nice. Um, and so the idea with tidal locking, and fun fact, uh, we actually have that really close to home. The moon is tidally locked to Earth. So what that means, what tidal locking means, is that the same face of the object is always facing um, its you know counterpart. So in the case, I wish I had. I wish I had balls or something to showcase with. I think I might. Ah, yes. Tennis balls. Okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> she just popping up props. I love it. Yeah, just in your props. office, <laughs> just vibing. Yeah, you got some props. All right, we're gonna we're gonna <laughs> pretend that the tennis ball is Earth and uh, the the this uh, stress ball. It's a Canadian tire ball, actually. Uh, is um is the moon. So this is not to scale. <laughs> this is not to scale. But the idea is that so the Earth is spinning. The Earth is spinning around, and the Moon is orbiting around the Earth. But it's keeping the same. So I'm going to actually do it with a little person on the hopscotch thing here. So the same face of the moon is always facing Earth. It's always facing Earth. So when we say the dark side of the moon, we actually don't mean like it's physically dark. We mean that we've never seen it before because you can't see it from Earth. Um, so that would be like, if this is the face we always see, it's this opposite part. You never see it. And this happens in very specific cases. 
uh, when you have objects that are of similar mass and are relatively close to each other. So um, there is a little bit more dynamics to talk about in there, but I'm not going to turn my laptop to the blackboard and do that. <laughs> Seems like a lot. So uh, <laughs> what? Ha so essentially, what happens with tidal locking is that your things of, of relatively similar mass. Um, so you know, the Earth and the Moon are not the same mass, but they are kind of similar. Um, they're not. They're not as different as say, you know, Jupiter and Saturn and some of their moons, for example. Um, but another good example would be Pluto and Charon. Um, they're almost identical in mass. Uh, Sharon's a little bit smaller. And they're also tidally locked. So the same face is facing that center object at all times. You only see the one part of it. Um, and as I said, with exoplanets, with exoplanetary systems, the ones that have been detected so far, a lot of them have um, planets that are not the same size as their star, but much closer in mass to their star than what we see in our solar system. And so those planets, while orbiting their sun, are also tidally locked to their sun. Uh, so they have a permanent day side and a permanent night side. So this is the idea with uh, tidally locked. Cool, no, that makes a lot of sense. I just want you to follow me around and I can ask you all of my astronomy questions, like just like a little shadow. <laughs> That's amazing. I'm just looking, um, it looks like uh, we have no further uh, questions this evening. So I believe that brings us to the end of our program. Um, a couple of housekeeping notes. This Friday, Dr. Mubdi Rahman will be releasing another amazing video from his Picture in a Thousand Word series. Um, so he'll take you through some iconic images in space in the span of about 10 minutes and just explain them. And, and once again, you'll of course learn a lot. Um, we are taking next week off as it is, depending on where you're watching here, it is Canada Day week. So I believe we will be here next for Cosmos from Your Couch on July 7th. Um, and it, it's uh, an episode that I'm really excited about with Dr. John Percy. It's going to be the astronomical heritage of Toronto, which I love Toronto history so much. Um, so I'm super excited for that. Um, and yeah, with that, thank you, CJ. I neglected to tell you that it was our 20th episode. I didn't want, you know, didn't want to make you nervous, but thank you so much for for uh, for joining us this evening and giving us, you know, a talk that, you know, it's it's not theoretical astrophysics is not an easy mountain to climb, but you 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 did it with, you know, with amazing jokes as well. I'm going to go to bed singing the body body break. <laughs> tonight <laughs> so i commend you for that um so thank you so much for joining us and with that we will we will say good night um thank you everybody thanks good night good night cool